Anne, I think we're going to start off with you. So economists are already talking about real meaningful economic growth this year and how will an upturn impact your market segment? An upturn will have a meaningful impact on my market segment because I serve workers. I serve people making 50 to 70% of area median income, many of whom work in the restaurant and retail sector. So an economic upturn will bring those workers back to work at the scale that they're used to. Uh, so we'll see uh, increased uh, rent attainment levels. Uh, we'll see families who aren't struggling as much. Um, and we will see just uh, an industry that thrives. Well, how did you deal with collections during this time period? What were your collections like? They were actually stronger than I anticipated. Uh, again, I'm serving the workforce. Uh, a good portion of the people that I serve were essential workers. So every day they got up, they went out uh, into the workforce, they faced risk of COVID. Uh, but many of them had longer hours, uh, delivery truck drivers, healthcare workers. Um, so we saw a large number of our residents able to continue to maintain the critical elements of their lives, including paying rent. For the others, our property management companies who work with our nonprofit partners have deep expertise in tapping resources to help vulnerable populations. So we tapped uh, through our partners a large number of philanthropic sources as well as government sources. So really what we saw were our partners were working in um, a very supportive fashion with residents so that they could obtain the resources they needed to meet all their obligations, including their rent. By the way, it's great to hear that. Yeah. Michael, as one of the oldest public REITs that public held since 1968, obviously that was your great grandfather. Uh -huh. um, what, are the, what are the changes that you've seen over the years in your sector and how the REIT asset class has evolved over those years? Okay, so that was my father and he was 35 years old and he founded the company. I was six years old and uh, capitalized Mammoth with $2 million. And today we're about a $4 billion company. And uh, we've grown- By the way, it sounds like you did pretty well. Yes, our shareholders and, and we as big shareholders have done very well. And that's the beauty of real estate investment. It's a long-term investment vehicle. It's a great compounding machine. You reinvest your dividends over time and it tends to make money for you even when you're sleeping. It's a finite asset, it's a hard asset. It's By the way, that's much harder as a lawyer. Very yeah. hard to make money while you're sleeping. Uh, he was originally a lawyer and uh, <laughs> he realized to switch. And maybe one day uh, you'll come to that conclusion. But uh, you know, the pandemic has really shifted things. Uh, even before the pandemic, two thirds of our nation's uh, economy is consumer spending. It's a $20 trillion economy. The digital revolution came on as the internet bandwidth increased and people realized you could have an infinite inventory, in, infinite product selection online. And so the, the two thirds of consumer spending kept migrating from brick and mortar to, to digital e-commerce. And then the pandemic created a situation that drove it into overdrive and, uh, you know, Mammoth owns about 10% of the FedEx ground network and uh, FedEx is posting record package volume, mostly with home delivery. And there's huge demand for modern, smart, automated buildings. And uh, the old buildings did wholesale distribution, you know, forklifts loading up trucks, business to business type distribution. Now it's omni-channel, it's business to business and direct to your house, direct to consumer. And that entails robotics and automation. It's uh, a much more specialized smart building. And so Mammoth has a very young portfolio. And in addition to FedEx, we have Amazon and Home Depot and Ulta Beauty. And many of our tenants are, are posting record numbers because people have uh, migrated to-, to the How business. much did you expand during the pandemic? Oh, well, we had a good pipeline of deals. Uh, it wasn't so much expansion during the pandemic, but the pandemic drove a need for future expansion. So our tenants are realizing they need more van stalls. They need a lot more parking to get directly to consumers. So we have a huge amount of expansion projects in our pipeline that are a direct result of the pandemic. 
They'll be coming online before peak season. Peak season is October through January, the Christmas holidays. We'll get as many parking expansions done for this peak sp uh, season. And then some will be in 2022 and some will flow to 2023. But the, the pull forward of demand, it's been over three years of what was projected to be the amount of package volume has pulled forward. So we're going to hit these 100 million packages per day much sooner than was previously predicted. Is that like 100, 100 million vaccines? Uh, well, we're we're shipping vaccines too. FedEx is. I was, I was pretty I was pretty sure that you were. Yes, yes. FedEx is shipping millions of vaccines and the PPE, the, the masks, and all the support equipment uh, to 220 countries as we speak. Okay. Uh, Gemma, in 2018, a Wall Street art Journal article quoted a certain Bill Ferguson, probably somebody mm -hmm. you know, who's the chief executive of Ferguson Partners where he stated the reed industry is not the most enlightened group when it comes to the diversity around the table. How significant is this problem and are we doing, and what are we doing about it in the boardroom? And can you give us some examples that will actually make us feel better about how we're trying to address these issues? <laughs> yeah, thanks, John. So yeah, I would say it would be a very fair thing to say that the REIT industry, and in fact, the real estate industry pretty holistically has been a little slower to the table than some of the other industries with respect to the e &I initiatives. Um, you know, it really did take kind of the investors jumping on board for um, for the for the boardroom really to sit up and take notice of, of the need to have gender diversity within the boardroom. I think most of us will now acknowledge that the majority of the, the REIT world has done a pretty good job over the last few years kind of bringing gender diversity to, to the boardroom. Um, I, yeah, the I last assume that's of years, mostly because they've engaged you to do that. <laughs> exactly. One of our favorite initiatives is suddenly, you know, as a woman, putting other women into the real estate industry has been a personal passion of mine and certainly of Bill Ferguson's too. So definitely we've been key and, and part of that. I think as, as that is being accepted by, by the industry and really sort of advocated for, we've certainly changed our, uh, uh, our attentions to um, ethnic diversity within the boardroom, within the REIT C-suite. Um, and spend a lot of our time now trying to help, um, you know, board members uh, figure out how's the best way to bring uh, gender, uh, ethnic diversity into into the boardroom. Um, you know, it's definitely an important conversation. And then I think it was sort of obviously accelerated by the Black Lives Matter uh, initiatives that were all happening last year. So it's kind of front and center, I'd say, of, of nearly all boardrooms today. Um, you know, I think the important thing to realize is that regardless of the skill set that you're looking for with a board member, regardless if you want somebody with real estate experience or other um, asset class experience or functional experience, you can find great talent that is, all, is also ethnically diverse. And I think you can look at firms like Avalon Bay that recently ran a search for a new independent director um, and actually ended up hiring uh, two African-American individuals to join their board. So I think if you sort of set your mind to By the way, by the way Nana is a close friend and is awesome. She's Brilliant, awesome. absolutely awesome, brilliant addition. And so, you know, Chris Howard, two great, great additions to the board. Um, I think another thing to mention, which I hope will become more and more of a conversation within the boardroom, is not just adding independent directors that um, are African American or Spanish, Asian, etc., um, but also to think through making sure that there's some board members, lead independent board members, or chairs of committees, or chair men and women, um, to also be um, ethnically diverse. I think that once we get to that point, then we'll really see change in the boardroom. Um, can you speak at all about the uh, the Mac Halley changes and uh, the the new CEO? And obviously, you had a woman who was an interim CEO who also happens to be a close friend. So, uh, can you comment on on that change? And I think that's a very interesting kind of result. I think very interesting and, and illuminating for people on the uh, participating yeah. in this event. I think it's a great example, to be honest, of how, um, and obviously I'm a little bit biased here because we did actually run the, the search on behalf of the um, search committee at McCalley, but something that was abundantly clear um, from day one for us, it was that diversity, both of gender and ethnicity, was super important to the search um, committee of McCalley. 
Um, you know, we had to hunt harder and, and longer to make sure that we had a diverse shortlist. And, and ultimately, the selection was made to appoint one of the independent directors into the into the CEO seat, bringing um, diversity to 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 the um, the leadership team there. And then you've probably seen thereafter as well that Tammy Jones, who was the um, was a key, a key, yeah, a key member of the search committee, was also appointed um, chairperson of the of the board. So you know, really well deserved by Tammy, you know, and also you know, great to see an, a good example on the um, stock exchange of having a, a woman chairperson that's also of color. Yes, I agree. Um, and over the last few years, we've seen a lot of headline issues the impact of climate change, racial and economic inequities, a public health crisis that we've all lived through over the past year with the pandemic. How do those headlines uh, issues play into your business plan? Those headline issues are virtually line items in my business plan or headers for different sections. So let's start- right, That's why we did all that stuff, to make it easier for you to do your business Thank plan. You. Very helpful. Um, let's start with climate change. What we do is we buy older apartment buildings, properties built in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and we green them up so that we have an immediate impact uh, in improving our carbon footprint, reducing our natural resources usage. So climate change starts first and foremost for us with the real estate and how do we make that real estate better prepared for uh, more extreme climate conditions and better able to utilize the natural resources that we use. Uh, and repeatedly we see, you know, using California as an example, uh, when we've gone in and bought a 1980s vintage building and been able to reduce water usage by 40% uh, because so many parts of the buildings were leaking. Um, and uh, there weren't low flow, flow toilets, there weren't low flow shower heads. So you can have a big impact and we're committed to having a big impact. Um, what percentage of that saving was just leaky pipes where water was just seeping out of the building as opposed to installation of new uh, fixtures that actually you know, are focused on trying to reduce the amount of water usage? You know, we said 40% reduction. How would you break that up into those two different pots? Uh, most of it was um, installation of new uh, fixtures. New fixtures. Uh, but there were there was some just you know going around the grass Waste. and looking at the uh, uh, water fixtures. Uh, so it did have an impact. Um, and that discipline focus on greening up properties is not only the right thing for all of us in terms of the environment, but it's the right thing for the bottom line because we reduce our operating expenses by making these types of investments. Uh, next, you talked about uh, racial diversity and uh, the really bad headlines we have seen about racial inequalities. Um, and what we know, all of us, is that uh, Black and Hispanic households rent more at, at a much higher percentage of their population than white households. So the apartments that we own and invest in have an, uh, a disproportionate number of uh, Black and Hispanic residents. Uh, that's our population uh, at, at a larger scale. Um, and a core element of the way we do our business, it actually is a differentiated uh, business approach, is we treat residents with respect. There are many people in the lower cost affordable housing sector who use tenant abuse and property abuse as a business strategy. So to give you an example, when we buy a property, we survey the residents and ask what they need, what do they want? And the number one thing people say is, I want you to listen to me. I need the property managers to respond uh, to my concerns. That water heater that's been leaking for six months, I want somebody to replace it. I don't want water dripping from the apartment above. When I call, I need you. And um, when you make those sorts of repairs, listening to what your residents need, you make better real estate and you make a better community. Uh, so it, it's, it's a good business strategy. And then the last was, okay, the pandemic. Well, we're in real estate and particularly in the apartment business, 
there's always something. It's not going to be a pandemic. It's going to be a hurricane. It's going to be fires. It's going to be uh, an earthquake. And we manage our properties for, in effect, the worst case scenarios. We know there will be this type of major disruptive events across a normal life cycle for our, our holes of apartment buildings. And we plan for that in our underwriting uh, so that we're not operating to the margin. And can you tell me what your investor base looks like? I mean, what's the profile of someone who's investing in your REIT? Because it's it's a specialized REIT, right? I mean, you, 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 you have a, 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 a passion and a mission which is not only to generate returns, but to generate it in a, a socially responsible way. So, so what is your investor? What do your core investors look like? Well, we are in our goal to acquire and preserve affordable housing um, in opportunity communities that enable residents of modest means to have all the things they need for a successful life. So the investors who invest with us are uh, impact investors. Now, it could be big institutional investors. We have large philanthropies like Ford and MacArthur. We have large banks, uh, City, Morgan Stanley, Schwab. We have big insurance companies, Prudential. And we also have family offices. Uh, but everyone who invests with us absolutely wants a fair return on their investment, but they also want to know that their money is going to good and is having an impact in the communities that they care about. Great. Michael, so ESG and corporate governance are a big focus throughout the investment world today. How do they affect your thinking? Well, ESG concerns have been our common concern throughout our 53-year history. Uh, today, you know, they are more prominent and need to be articulated and uh, displayed uh, more prominently than in the past, but a, a profitable company brings so much to society at large. It's the pillar of what makes a community have a high quality of living and increased living standards. It's the generator of employment and so much economic well-being. So it just in and of itself, having a, a long-term profitable company brings a lot uh, to the benefit of society. Uh, but now, you know, the focus is on clean energy, uh, we have 25 million square feet of roofs that we can put to work with solar panels and generate tremendous energy. Uh, many of our tenants are focusing on electric vehicles and liquid hydrogen forklifts and vehicles. And, and we have a lot of acreage and big parking lots and we could build charging stations and do things to generate cost savings for our tenants. Uh, rent is a small component of our tenants' expense structure, rounding up, it's 5% of their total expenses, but transportation costs is a big component. So, so if you, we could reduce their transportation costs with clean energy, uh, as Ann said, it's a win-win. It's a win for the company, it's a win for the tenant. How likely it is do you think you'll turn those roofs into solar energy generators? very likely. Uh, tenants are carving it out now in their leases, the right to do so and how to partner with them. Uh, it's already taking place in some instances throughout the industrial sector and throughout our, our portfolio. So very likely. Very much. Gemma, many businesses seem willing to put in the hard work to make diversity, equity, and inclusion a, a long-term priority. What recommendations do you have because you've been so involved in this sector? to align diversity, equity, and inclusion and ESG initiatives with compensation schemes. How do those two marry up? Do you know what, John? You probably sort of hit the nail on the head with respect to one of the most talked about um, topics right now in the boardroom of, of REITs. I think the first thing to remember is that the actual um, ESG or DE&I strategy has to come first, right? You've got to get that right for the organization before you can try and overlay that with a compensation plan. So number one, you know, we constantly say to clients, you know, focus on DE&I, focus on, on ESG. And once you have got a strategy that you all agree with, philosophically, regardless of compensation, that you think it's right for the organization and right for society, then you can overlay that with a compensation structure that will help you kind of hold the, you know, your senior leadership's toes to the fire, so to speak. But you've got to start from the right place, which is to figure out what that 
program should be. And then the other thing to remember, which is really important, is you've got to think through what are the other ramifications if you do put a compensation structure around these initiatives. So a good example might be you could say to the CEO, okay, your leadership team needs to be more gender diverse or ethnically diverse. You still need to make sure, therefore, when people are promoted up into that leadership team, that the right decisions are being made, and therefore, you know, you're not putting an incentive in place that doesn't align the best interests of the firm. So, really, sort of tying those two things together is really important. And what John, do you advise in people? John, can I just jump in on that? Please? Sure, absolutely. So, on the topic of aligning interests and compensation, you Michael, know, could you I... speak up a little bit? Because yeah. that... <laughs> on the topic of aligning interests and compensation you know REITs don't get enough credit for the alignment of interests we have with our shareholders in the fact that they get compensated we are required to distribute through the form of dividends all of our taxable income and yet from a corporate governance standpoint uh, the ISS groups and Glass Lewis don't give us any credit for that but what could be better corporate governance than returning all the income to the shareholders. And, and so it's something, I think NARIC does a great job promoting the REIT asset class as does NYU, uh, but the rating agencies really don't give us the credit we deserve for billions of dollars in dividend distributions year after year after year. And, and, and aligning ourselves with the shareholders, what could be better than the pure economics of returning the earn, income directly to them and let them make the decision on how to reallocate that capital. Michael, although I would yeah. think the issue is obviously the the people in the boardroom, senior executives are all being compensated. So what comes back to the shareholders is after the 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 executive suite is being compensated. And we know that some executive suites are being compensated differently than other executive suites. And obviously people weigh in, shareholders, some of these uh, you know, different uh shareholder groups weigh in on that issue. So I agree that the distributions are, are incredibly important. And obviously a lot of people uh, invest in the REIT sector because of those distributions and people who've got a history of you know, making significant di uh, dividend distributions. By the same token, there are REITs and REITs and not everybody, not all, all REITs are created equal. No, I agree with John. You're saying follow the money. I'm saying follow the money. <laughs> and, uh, That's what my mother taught me. She said always follow the money. You know, ISS and Glass Lewis often post a performance metric. It's usually table number one, exhibit one, and it's price only. And you have to read the fine print to see it's price only. And when you include total return and REITs are total return vehicles, we outperform the broad market. But if you take the dividend component away and, and show this disingenuous performance metric of price only, you're really tying more than one hand behind our back and suddenly we've underperformed as an asset class, the REIT sector, underperformed the, the broad market. So uh, it's very disingenuous to take a total return vehicle and only look at one component, whether it's the price only or the dividend only, you got to look at both. I agree. And Michael, it's perfect. So this is not 2008 and REIT balance sheets <laughs> are significantly stronger today than they were in the old days with leverage near historic lows. How has the pandemic affected the REIT industry generally, um, you know, and obviously amongst different sectors? And what do you see going forward? So this is for me, John? Yeah, this is for you. Okay. Um, well, the pandemic, you know, it, it's been a tale of at least two cities. Uh, people, at least two. Yeah, the hotels and, uh, and the offices and, uh, and retail, which was already struggling, and student housing and senior housing really took the brunt and saw tremendous headwinds from the pandemic. Uh, conversely, if you're mandated to stay at home, you're mandated to shop online. And therefore, industrial probably benefited more so than any property sector. And we saw record occupancy, record earnings, record demand. And so therefore, capital that used to flow into those other property types made a, a U-turn and, and everything clamored to be an industrial and there's tremendous demand for our property type now. So I, I do think uh, the pandemic is receding with the vaccines and herd immunity. And, and at some point we'll, uh, uh, all property types will, will benefit as they did pre-pandemic. And as the real estate markets become increasingly competitive, 
How do you find the, the great opportunity? Does it require greater risk for you to try and achieve the same target returns? Um, or is that, do you have a different uh, way of achieving that? We really do have a secret sauce in our partners with our- I heard that. I had heard you had a secret sauce. It is, it, and it works. Uh, because we were founded by the leading nonprofit affordable housing providers uh, and continue to, part with them to uh, partner with them to do our deals. They have decades of experience in the markets and the sub-markets that we are seeking. They already own a large number of assets in those markets and sub-markets, so they're already in neighborhood. So their ability to analyze opportunities uh, with a degree of real context and texture that far outstrips what you get from any market study you ever see uh, is a huge advantage for us. So while I do have a national team of acquisition folks who look at deals and uh, we get the same calls and overtures everybody else does, um, that partnership with people who know the neighborhood better and who know the local economics, who know what's going to happen with jobs in that community, what's happening with government uh, is, is truly an advantage. Uh, but we are very disciplined investors. We cannot afford to overpay for assets because we're serving people of modest means and we can't fix a mistake on our part by raising rents 20, 30 percent. That won't meet our mission. Uh, so we're very disciplined about what we will invest in when uh, and about how we will make the math problem of serving people of modest means largely without, in, without deep federal subsidy. Exactly. How often do you partner with local government in terms of the projects that you do? We often partner with local governments in, as a sweetener for the deals that we do. So our, our deals primarily have to pencil out on a straight market basis, rent coming in, expenses. Um, By the way, even I can figure that out. Exactly. Uh, but we uh, are usually able to benefit from state and local tax abatements because of use restrictions on the property and the management of the property by our nonprofit. Use restrictions that are there when you get there or use restrictions that you impose as part of a deal with local government? Both. Uh, both. Um, and uh, we also often get uh, soft subordinate financing from local governments um, where they want to have this asset preserved as affordable housing because the neighborhood's gentrifying rapidly and they know they need to have a diverse workforce within their community and they don't want to drive people out. Uh, so we often take advantage of some soft uh, debt behind our primary mortgage debt. Uh, and of course, we do accept Section 8 in all our properties because we believe in doing that and we're good at that. Uh, doesn't mean that most of our units have Section 8. They don't. Probably no more than 30% of our units have Section 8, but uh, we use that as another resource. Where, where, do most of, where does most of your financing come from? How much is local banks? How much is agency financing? What do you generally use to finance your project? Uh, it's Fannie, Freddie, and a little FHA. Okay. Demo, so certain corporate boardrooms are benefiting from their focus on succession planning. Um, what trends are you currently seeing in the boardroom succession planning as corporations attempt to ensure a uh, smooth leadership transition, particularly as, you know, uh, the senior executive uh, uh, population ages a bit? and is thinking about that next generation? Yeah, that's a great question, John. Um, I guess in any industry, like real estate, the cyclical, you kind of always end up with some times where there's more succession planning happening than others. And suddenly with a very sort of extended bull market on the back of the GFC, I think many of us can see that that's a, there's a huge amount of succession planning happening now. And some of that is because the succession planning is happening for the first time for the C-suite. In other instances, actually, the succession planning has been done again because people did not move out of their seats and allow others to step up. And therefore, those yeah, that people were People thought they were going to move out and then they didn't. And they didn't. So therefore, people got up, you know, got fed up waiting and have made other trades at this point. So I think some firms would be revisiting the succession plans they've already made. I would say another... 
the British royal family about that? Because I think that's an example of someone not meeting, moving out of the sea. I think, I, think I think there's also a question about diversity and inclusion. At least uh, I know that there was some issue about that. Yeah. And I would say right now, sort of best, best practice seems to be to, you know, run an internal process and hopefully you find your succession plans internally. Obviously, internal hires have got a much higher rate of success. Than, um, than external hires. So that is usually, um, you know, the, the priority of any of any boardroom, including within the REIT space. But to your very point, John, you may not have, um, you know, diverse talent in your senior leadership that might be able to step into those seats. So if it's important to the board to have a diverse slate of candidates, then oftentimes you will go both internal and external simultaneously. And best practice usually ends up, therefore, that you run a search the internal candidates will put their hats in the ring and you'll compare and contrast them with external candidates too. And the best person will sort of win out in those situations. Um, I would say another thing that's pretty interesting right now that's happening across sort of succession planning is just making sure where you have got um, you know, a pipeline of talent, maybe not just at the C-suite, but a level below, that you're putting the right infrastructure around people to be able to help them get to um, where they might need to go in, in that succession plan. So coaching, leadership development, um, all of those things that maybe were not really front and center of all REIT boardrooms in the past now very much are something that's important and people are spending, investing good amounts of money into developing their own talent. Are you find people adopting some kind of mentorship programs? I mean, as you said, you know, if you're trying to look from within, then it kind of depends mm -hmm. on what you've grown there. So, for example, if you're if you're interested in having, you know, a diverse C-suite and, you know, if you haven't made that diversity uh, a core tenant over the last X number of years, so you've had people grown up within the system that kind of meet those criteria, then it's very hard to say, OK, well, now I'm going to promote somebody and I look around the room and shockingly, there's there aren't as many candidates that are either ethnically or gender diverse. So it's very hard to say I'm going to promote within, but by the way, there's no one who qualifies that meets those criteria. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a, an issue and, and probably one that's going to take a long time for us to fix. Like, you know, obviously with the grassroots DNI initiatives happening, et cetera, it's still going to take some time for that to, to filter through to the, to the most senior, senior ranks. Um, another thing that I would add on with respect to, to those comments is like historically, you know, within the real estate industry, many individuals have been fantastic investment professionals and real deal junkies. They might not be natural leaders. So a lot of the training and development that goes on today is how do you help those, those, those investment professionals, those deal junkies be a great leader? Um, you know, our psychologists within our leadership development group spend a lot of time with those, you know, CIOs or even CFOs or other individuals that need to earn their, you know, leadership stripes to have a good chance of stepping into a CEO seat in the future. Mike, also, many companies are seeing an increase in investor activism. How do you see these activists and how do you think management should deal with their concerns? Well, John, as someone in the middle of an activist situation, I am somewhat limited. I, I heard that. Yes, yes. But I would be talking more generally. I wouldn't be talking about your own situation. No, of course, I will be only speaking generally. And having been a student at the NYU Real Estate Institute, I know that the students deserve uh, experience and forthright and open, honest commentary. So, so in that vein, uh, you know, REITs um, and all, all public companies work really hard of building, creating, and preserving long-term value. And for the most part, REITs have done an exceptional job. We've outperformed the stock market and the bond market over the long term. And uh, it's truly a, a long-term proposition. And uh, uh, it's best that we align ourselves with long-term investors and people who are knowledgeable about the long-term attributes of real estate investment. And activism can, not always, but it can have a, a short-term focus. And uh, people who are interested in a short-term pop may be doing so uh, in, at the expense of, of long-term, true long-term value creation. 
And so management teams and their investors need to always balance, you know, what are truly in the long-term interests of the company and its shareholders when they're looking at an activist situation. Because I, I can tell you as disruptive as the pandemic has been, it's a walk in the park compared to uh, dealing with an activist situation. So um, to the students out there, you know, always be creative, always be trying to build value, uh, spend your time on creative endeavors. Uh, activism could be a very disruptive, very uh, destructive pastime. And, and I encourage you to be creative and not destructive. So Gemma, there's evidence that increased activism has begun to make REIT boards more accountable. What types of government governance enhancements and culture shifts are you advising REITs to make in the wake of that act? And then yeah. I'll come back to you because I know you had something to say. <laughs> I would say both from a governance and a cultural shift perspective, um, the number one piece of advice that we give to any, any REIT or, or any board is to be proactive. Um, you know, once you wait, if you wait until you're a target of activism, oftentimes it's a little bit too late to then have the effect that you want. So usually the number one most effective strategy um, is board refreshment, you know, bringing in fresh perspectives, bringing in new talent, bringing in different ways of thinking, you know, even bringing people in from outside the industry and, and other industries that are really helpful to the real estate industry today, like technology, um, luxury consumer, logistics, et cetera. Just bringing fresh blood into the boardroom is probably one of the, again, one of the best pieces of counsel we can give, but also um, one of the best ways of which you can really affect your, your culture and your thinking as a firm. Yeah, but how often do you see that where people are being brought into, onto the boards that really come from very different disciplines? They're not, they're not coming out of the real estate industry. Right now, actually, and actually just for the last few years, it has been a real trend. You know, the sort of, you know, the old boys club of just putting people on the board that you knew from the industry has definitely evolved into firms being much more strategic to think what kind of industries, what kind of skill sets, what kind of thinking would be helpful. And obviously, you know, in the industrial sector right now, obviously people have been very much focused on getting people from the logistics industries into their boardroom. In multifamily, people have been focused on getting people from luxury consumer goods, and pretty much anybody would welcome somebody that's got a tech background or experience that today. So that's been important. It's also been really instrumental in bringing women and ethnic diversity into the boardroom, because if we don't just have to search in real estate and we can look in many different industries for a skill set or an experience set, it opens up the opportunity to, to, to bring the right person into the boardroom. And you wanted to make a comment before? I wanted to comment on a couple of things that Michael said. One is that key issue of building long-term value because that's the business we're in. We are not flip this house. We are not get rich quick. We are looking for investors who are disciplined investors who are committed to the asset class and to this space over a longer duration. Uh, so if the investor activism is all about short-termism, that can be very damaging for all of us. But the other side of investor activism that's important for my sector, the impact investing sector, is that activist investors are holding impact funds accountable to the results that we're promising we'll get. And they're asking tough questions about whether or not we're going as far, as high, as wide, as deep as we should be going. Uh, to call ourselves impact funds, and they're also bringing new ideas to us. So they're looking across sectors, particularly in the impact space, and saying, you know, here's what I'm seeing everywhere else. Why is that not relevant to your space? So for us, it's a real uh, welcome challenge to have activist investors who really do want to hold us accountable. And frankly, we're happy to have activist investors looking at some of our competition because, hmm, you know, not everybody is as focused on impact while calling themselves an impact fund. By the way, that was just what I was going to ask you. How many people within the, quote, activist or, or uh, impact investor um, grouping or category uh, are actually actually belong there? Is it is it 100%? Is it 50%? I mean, how much of a spread is in there for people who you really believe are, are accomplishing those core values 
and how many people are marketing themselves as that, but maybe really don't belong there. I can't give you a good assessment. I think it's up to the investor to truly read what the fund is selling. You know, because uh, if you dig deep into somebody's uh, offering documents, you'll see how they measure themselves. And I have looked at some funds who are making important, but really around the margins changes to the work that they're doing. And so sure, it's it's a good thing. Is it worth taking a hit on uh, returns for that? Well, investors have to look hard. Um, I, I think the bigger challenge for all of us in the impact space is we're still in a misaligned metrics time. There are a lot of different measurement systems for how you measure impact. Uh, there are a number of important efforts to create measures that you can use apples to apples across industries, um, but the, the metric set hasn't fully settled out. So investors do have to do more diligence, I think, if impact is what matters most to them to make sure they understand what they've purchased. Michael, so that, you know, certainly Anna's company should be- Michael, could you speak up a little bit? I... Okay. So just to jump in on the proxy advisory groups and how they quantify and rank companies, they often miss out on qualitative attributes. Uh, granted, qualitative attributes are, are harder to rank, but they like to see boards with short tenures. They think uh, long experience boards equals entrenchment. In the old days, it was experience. Now it's entrenchment. And the average board tenure, I believe, that they like to see right now is about four years. But what that means is a company that has great longevity is getting punished for their cycle-tested, battle-tested success. And a company that hasn't been battle-tested and hasn't been around for very long gets applauded for their short duration. And you take it to its logical conclusion and they are saying that Warren Buffett from Berkshire Hathaway and Fred Smith from FedEx and Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan should be refreshed. And, and, and I don't see how it's in the shareholder interest for founders of companies and long tenured directors who are truly you know, the, the superstars of the company and, and have the experience to lead it to places no one else can should be refreshed just for the sake of refreshment. So um, I would now kind of, as we bring the panel toward a close, I would ask each of you one final question to respond uh, with each of your thoughts, which is, in your professional opinion, what is the most important factor or condition that will allow REITs and commercial real estate to return to a new normal? And what do you think the landscape of REITs will look like this time next year? And Anne, why don't we start with you? It's all about the vaccine. Mm -hmm. It's all about the vaccine. It's all about the vaccine. Protected so they can go back to work, so they can go out to restaurants, they can go out to movies. They, it, it comes back to the vaccine. Okay, so let's assume that the vaccine has now been rolled out. We had 100 million, we're going to have 200 million. Everybody who agrees to be vaccinated is vaccinated. Okay. Are we going back to what where we were? Or are we going back to a new normal that's different? Are people are people coming in three days a week? Are they coming in five days a week? Are they working from home? Are they fifty percent working from home? What what do you think people are going to be doing? All of the above, I would say. To be honest, I don't think there's going to be one size fits all in in this debate. I think there's going to be companies that before COVID were remote one day a week that might come back remote two days a week. I think the employees might want to be home three days a week and in the office two days a week, but there's going to be a bit of a negotiation between both sides to find something that allows the team to come together to allow the culture building that we're all missing um, today when we're working through a Zoom video camera all the time. 
Um, there's also going to be people that are displaced that aren't going to want to come back to New York City or to San Francisco or to other places. Wait, wait, who could and possibly not want to come back to New York City or San Francisco? I cannot wait to be back on that aeroplane. I'm missing LaGuardia Airport like there's no tomorrow. I can't wait to be back. But um, yeah, I think that there's going to be different scenarios for different companies, for different situations, for um, you know many, many different scenarios. There won't be one size that fits all. Um, I think the think other that's important varying thing by, by 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 sector or by company or by everything. Just going to be. I think geography is going to have a bit to play of this. I think if you're in a big city where public transport, I think is going to be slightly different to if you're in um, Dallas, Texas, and you drive to work. I think there's going to be very different scenarios. Um, I also think even, there's going to be people. Even after the vaccine. Even after the vaccine. Yeah, I think people's, you know, people that, you know, said to me over the years, like, I'm a diehard New Yorker, I will never leave the city, um, that have decided through this pandemic. Others, unlike you, John, that have decided through the pandemic that they suddenly want to move to Denver and, and, and live there, right? That's going to be the, the case. And if it's a key employee... Then they have to go to Denver people. and live there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they might do. Um, you know, I think another thing that will be just key just for everybody to feel like we've kind of got back to some degree of normality is for Biden to open the borders, like let people that are vaccinated back into the US of A, like, come on, this is something that's important for so many people across the, the globe today. And I think important for everything, right? Tourism, hotels, hospitality, restaurants, gaming, that we need to open the borders once people can demonstrate that they've been vaccinated. And that isn't being talked enough, uh, enough right now, I, I think. Michael? Well, to kind of echo what Anne and, and Gemma said, you know, if you try to imagine the pandemic, the depths of the pandemic without the use of the digital revolution, no smartphones, no internet, no connectivity, it would have been devastating. But devastating. The digital revolution, mm -hmm. It was sustainable and it was revelatory. Uh, the umbilical cord that connected us back to the analog world has been cut. It's been severed as a result of the pandemic. And we're realizing that you don't need to be chained to the desk from nine to five, Monday through Friday. You could get out and be extremely productive, perhaps even more productive from uh, all different situations. And so, I think that going forward, people will be uh, able to use digital tools uh, faster, better, uh, and to a deeper extent than would otherwise be the case. Yeah, I would say that I think that also we we kind of dealt with it on an interim basis. I mean, I think we all knew that ultimately there was an end to it. And certainly once the vaccine started coming online, I think everyone saw a light at the end of the tunnel. And I think there are certainly, we managed to survive and, and in some cases prosper, but, but I think there's a sense that, you know, people want to reconnect with people. They want to reconnect. They want to be seeing people in person. They want to have that connectivity. They want to, in effect, have the collaboration opportunities that allow us to come up with fresh ideas. And while we can do some things online and Zoom and, and WebEx are much better than just the phone and the phone is better than just, you know, email exchanges, I think the, the being in person has a dramatically different effect. So I believe me, I look forward to the NYU conference when it's all in person, which <laughs> belongs. I think we all do. Um, mm -hmm. I want to thank everybody for participation today. I think you were all great. Um, and I have no doubt that all the people participating in the conference and all the students from NYU will have the opportunity to hear what you all had to say will all uh, take great benefit from that. So uh, thank you, everybody. I think it's been a, a fun panel. And I think people have had a lot to say and a lot to add. So I just want to thank you all. Good morning, Sandeep. Um, so. What do you see on the horizon for central business districts and the office market? Particularly, we had a, an article in the New York Times today that, that I thought was uh, really looking at the, at the glass half empty as opposed to the glass half full, but obviously would be very interested in your perspective. So good morning, John. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, uh, I'm a big believer of the reversion to the mean, uh, which means that I think central business districts will be back. That's where this activity is, so people want to be. Uh, you know, and effectively the youth want to come back to the offices. We saw last week, just last week, uh, both Morgan Stanley asked their people to come back to work. Uh, you know, Amazon 
Uh, John Shotler basically said they're going to take come back into all their offices. There's, there's going to be no reduction in office space. Um, KPMG produced a report that basically said at the height of the pandemic, 69% of the CEOs thought about uh, not returning to work full time, and now it's only 17%. So I think the dynamism and the romanticism of work from home has shifted uh, completely. I think New York actually will bounce back much faster than other cities. And I think New York and London both will bounce back uh, much faster uh, than other cities. Um, I think people fail to really appreciate the value of a central business district, the restaurants, the environment, the camaraderie, uh, the culture building. Uh, you know, you've got a million uh, people who work in, uh, in New York City. Uh, even if they were to relocate, where are they going to relocate to? Uh, there's not enough housing in suburbia. There's, you know, I think we keep talking about these things because we're really focused on the upper echelon of every society. We're not focused on the, the, the actual workers who come into the city every day. So I actually do think central business districts, such as the ones in New York, will bounce back much faster. London, uh, you know, the uh, effectively the finance minister. Uh, produced an article last week talking about bringing people back uh, to uh, to uh, uh, to uh, to London. So I, I think they do bounce back. I think San Francisco may be a little slower, uh, quite honestly, uh, than, than than New York. But I think New York bounces back. How much of your business is based in New York and London? How what what proportion of your overall? So uh, between New York and London is about fifteen percent of the global business. So it's quite large. Yeah, I would have thought. Uh, yeah. Um, in your opinion, to what, what extent do ESG and sustainability affect your investment decision? You, you know, again, the irony of the business is, you know, when I was in the retail shopping center business, ESG was a very hard thing uh, because the retailers, you're so dependent upon the retailers. Now I sort of, re I've reversed my life in the sense I'm now a, I'm, I'm now a tenant, not a landlord. Uh, and so, so now effectively what happens is the landlords in this business in the office sector have always been focused on ESG. Uh, I mean, you know, to be in a you know, gold or a platinum lead building has been, it's just sort of so standard today. So in the office business, I think the landlords took the high road many years ago to focus on, you know, the environmental part of it. Uh, you know, look, uh, you know, we, we work has always been very focused on doing good for the world, right? So it's always been very focused on environmental, uh, you know, the aspects of lack of, you know, paper cups and, you know, plastic cups has always been sort of the, you know, the, 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 the gold standard of the company was always focused on recycled products, no leather goods. I mean, it's always been very focused environmentally focused company. Uh, and, and both on the S and the G part of it, uh, you know, it's been very focused on, on the, my tenureship at GGP, uh, you know, where, I, you know, equality in every aspect was so critical to our success uh, and, we, and we believed it. Uh, and so again here, uh, it's the, the voice from the top and the voice on the top is to make sure that we have that level of equality and fairness uh, in the company. So ESG is, I, I, you know, I think it's no longer a, you know, a um, cliche or is no longer, a, you know, it's just a must have. I mean, I don't even, I quite honestly know why people discuss it so much because it should be part of your core fabric. Uh, and if it's not core part of your core fabric, then I think you're a decade behind. Uh, so I think it's uh, just part of what we do every day. I think that's kind of the nature of your company and maybe not every company is at the same, you know, at the same level and on the same path as, as, as you are. Yeah, but I don't think people should be talking about it like it's something unique. It's just part of what you need to, you know, even if you're not there, you should have a path to get there. It shouldn't be talked about like it's something completely unique. Um, how has technology changed how you find opportunities and how you conduct your business today? Uh, you know, our business is actually very interesting, you know, uh, and if I sort of just go back to your earlier question of CBDs and I'll tell you how that sort of ties into this, you know, what we see, is you know people talk about cbds because they're very america focused they're very europe focused they don't realize how the world has moved right so we have 30 plus markets uh that have seen green shoots with double di double digit increase in occupancy uh and you know like whether it's china by you know beijing 14 points and shanghai 12 points and seoul korea double digits and munich 44 points and manchester uk 26 points so we're seeing double digit increases in occupancy 
And to answer your question, who's fueling that occupancy? That occupancy is being fueled kind of interestingly by small, medium businesses today. Okay, even though more than 54% of my business is large enterprises, the activity during the pandemic and as we come out of the pandemic is being fueled by small, medium businesses. And where we find small, medium businesses, we have an amazing tech platform, which again, when, when a real estate company, not a tech company, but every, I always sit back and say, either every company is what they are, or every company is a tech company, but they have hard assets. So you decide which direction you want to go. Like, you know, uh, like, you know, is, is Walmart a technology company? Is Walmart a real estate company? You know, a retail company? Is Amazon a logistics company? Is Amazon a tech company, right? So you could elect whichever way you want to go, but the point is you need technology to fuel it. And essentially today, our top of the funnel, Okay, which is how we, you know, get our small businesses is very big and it's all fueled uh, by by building a, a, a technology form. Like I was talking to a brokerage house this morning and they said, guys, you guys are really good at leasing to 50 people and above offices, but you're really bad leasing to 50 person and less offices. And so we do that all to top of the funnel, uh, all through technology. Uh, and so, you know, so you've got to really have today, you know, in any business that you are, uh, you have to be ahead of the curve on how you, how you build your tech platform. You so you teach the people that 50 people and less and all pursuing to a technology, what does that mean? How do you really do that? So basically it's all marketing, right? So you build marketing and MQLs, man, you know, you know, qualified leads for marketing and essentially you're addressing the marketplace and they actually come to your website or your app and they demand space and they essentially uh, go ahead and lease space completely automated from the time you, you find a space, book a space, uh, get a membership agreement and take your, your you know, your access card. It's all done. Uh, How long does that take? Uh, so for small businesses, generally it's a seven day turnaround. It happens instantaneously, but for the first time they hit it and they start doing their research right. to the time they actually come back and they sign an agreement is seven days. Enterprise clients, okay, today, in Europe are doing it in 20 days. That used to be a 90 day cycle. Today's a 20 day cycle. And that 20 day cycle, what, what size block are they taking in that 20 day cycle? 50,000 square feet or less. And for what, what duration? Uh, the enterprise guys average is 24 months, 24 and, months. and small businesses is an average is nine months. And the reason it's flexibility, right? So you're flexible on space, you're flexible on time. And you're portable on cost. Let's say you made a mistake. You took space with me in London. You say, ah, shit, I made a mistake. Well, I'll just move your money to Nashville, Tennessee on the remainder of your contract. And I have 850 locations. So in, in, in reality, by default, we are the largest landlord in the world for the number of locations. Maybe not number of square feet, but the number of locations, right? So you can port your money uh, between, between locations. So and flexibility it's not is- just an allocation issue. So if someone says, I needed space in London, but for some reason I'm now relocating those people and I really need to be elsewhere in the world. That, that money is good at just being relocated to the other. Correct. Side. And the reason is because all of them are owned by us. Like we don't have partners in buildings. We don't have, you know, different joint ventures. It's, it's you know, uh, a lot of office owners have different partners in different buildings. And so they don't know how to allocate. This is all under the WeWork umbrella. Okay, so as we talked about a little bit earlier, a large portion of the workforce, at least at the moment, is still working remotely. Can you speak to this trend and toward flex work and the impact that that's going to have on commercial real estate and traditional landlords? So, you know, pre-pandemic, which is what is most fascinating to me, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm learning, learning the office business uh, because obviously my background has been retail. So, which I found fascinating which is very much like in any industry, uh, pre-pandemic occupancy of office buildings was 65%. Okay, this is the biggest unknown fact that effectively we would have one desk or one person, but 35% of the office would be vacant at any given time because people were on holiday, they were traveling, they were seeing clients, they were seeing members. And by the way, a lot of them were working from home a day or two a week, pre-pandemic. It's just now been legitimized. That, okay, it's okay to work from home a day or two a week. Uh, and, and, and effectively, what happens is people talk about today occupancy being 50%. So the way I look at it is it's from 65 to 50, it's 15%, not 50%. So, so effectively, 
you're going to have this sort of hybrid work, uh, but it's going to be a hybrid work that's been legitimized. It was always there. Okay. No one spoke about it. Uh, you know, they weren't vocal about it. So effectively companies are thinking about how that should work. Okay. Should people be hybrid working Tuesdays and Thursdays? Should they hybrid work on a Wednesday? The entire, uh, you know, community of CEOs is very concerned about a hybrid work, which then becomes a four day work week. So a lot of companies are not going to allow you to work from home on a Monday or a Friday. Not do. No, no one wants the, 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 the four days to be every, every, everything but Monday or everything but Friday. Correct, correct. So this becomes a real concern. The second aspect here is, okay, you have to really think about what that really means. Who does it really affect? Okay, if you're eight people in a conference room and there are two people on a Zoom, those two people on the Zoom, unless they're the CEO of the company, are going to be ignored. They're just going to be ignored. There's going to be no growth for them. They're going to be stymied. They're going to go away. Okay, take it one step further. I'm working in Denver. Okay, because that's what I want to be. I want to work in Denver. I get laid off in Denver. Where am I going to find my I next job? Right. So the aspect of being in these central business districts is that there's there's more job, you know, availability to pivot from company A to company B, and and I think that there is this short term love because no one really understands it, and really it's about talent retention. So because of talent retention, people are afraid to talk about, uh, you know, uh, the, the aspect of if I'm the first only CEO to say no work from home, will I lose talent? It's actually working in reverse. A very large tech company in the UK is just offering $500 per person to apologize for working from home. Because what's happening is there's mental health issues there. People want to come to work. It could actually backfire. Okay. People are going to say, I want to grow. I want to be there. I want to be present. I want community. I want culture. And you're not telling me that you're going to deprive it because you, Mr. CEO, wants to save a few checkles. I really want to come to work. Okay. So I'm a big believer of the reversion to the mean. Okay. I, like, I think there will be adjustments, but that's just life is all about adjustments. Okay. Uh, I think there'll be more shared office space. I think there'll be more sharing of desks. Uh, I think all of that will occur. Sorry? Hoteling? I mean, I use, people call it hoteling. I don't like that word. I like, I like calling, you know, shared workspaces. It's a nicer word. <laughs> it's a nicer word. Uh, but I think it's going to happen because uh, effectively, uh, look, in my own office right now, uh, I gave up my office. And when I'm not in the office, it's used as a conference room. When I am in the office, I book it like anything else, like, you know, and I think, you know, you can have better utilization of space and I travel half the time. So what's the point of having this glorified office, okay, which is not being utilized when we have shortage of conference rooms in, in our organ organization. It's only ego that makes me have it, right? Uh, and so we, we use it as off, you know, conference room space when I'm not there. So you're going to start to see a lot more shared workspaces uh, and it's and it's also good because it allows teams to gather. There's collaboration hubs. You know, you, you know, you can have better cleaning. Imagine, look at your desk; it's cluttered, right? In a good way, in the sense, if I was to deep clean it, it'd be impossible in a COVID world. You'd have to get rid of some of the crap that's on top. That's true. <laughs> um, so. I have a question for you. So, so recently, uh, back this past Thursday. There was a public announcement about a deal between you and we were and one of the SPACs, um, which indicates, uh, you know, uh, a way forward for you to become a public entity. How do you weigh the advantages of being a public entity versus being a private entity with a, obviously a close alignment with SoftBank? Obviously, that's a, an interesting decision tree for you. And I think everyone would be interested in how you look at that. So, you know, actually, I wasn't out there looking to become a public entity this quickly. Uh, and, and but I was thinking about how to raise equity uh, and de-risk the balance sheet to make sure that we would be the winner as we come out of COVID. Uh, we really do believe whether it's us or any other flex provider, flexibility uh, of office space is going to continue to grow uh, as, we, as, we, as we navigate through the year. Uh, so I, I wanted to raise additional equity to make sure I de-risk the balance sheet. And we were approached uh, by a SPAC, 
uh, BOEX uh, and, uh, in December, and we decided to pursue the conversation. Uh, and as we sort of got more into the conversation, uh, and we start to see the green shoots in the business, which is very important. So you can start to see that you've hit bottom and you're starting to rise. Uh, again, having been a public company CEO, I wanted to make sure that, that, that I was, I'd hit bottom and I was starting to rise. Uh, we felt that uh, it was a route to worth pursuing, but it was only worth pursuing for us if we could raise the entire pipe, okay? Uh, you know, which is the private investment in public entities. Uh, and if we couldn't raise the entire pipe, we wouldn't do it because a lot of companies sign a merger agreement with a SPAC and then they go raise the pipe. We wanted to raise the pipe simultaneously. Uh, so we were able, we were oversubscribed. You know, our pipe was meant to be 500 million. Uh, we raised 800 million with subscription agreements with some of the best investors uh, in, the, in the business. Uh, and so- and you do uh, have some very sophisticated investors in your group. We, yeah, so, you know, obviously, you know, I think that, you, you know, the likes of Starwood, Fidelity, Insight, Centaurus, BlackRock, I mean, these are, you know, like a seal of approval. Seal of approval. Uh, and they do their diligence in the business. So we felt that, you know, we could raise a billion three. Uh, it would obviously provide us enough liquidity. Uh, we don't intend to touch the money. We have enough liquidity on our balance sheet. Uh, will provide us liquidity for growth. Uh, and if for whatever reason uh, there is a slowdown uh, because of the virus, we have enough liquidity. But but I think we all see light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, so this is this will be used for growth capital. So for, for the last question I have for you, so project that a year from now. What does the world look like a year from now? What does WeWork look like a year from now? What does the real estate landscape look like a year from now? Uh, I, 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 like I said, I'm a bigger believer of the reversion to the mean. So I'm a bigger believer that, you know, people will start to come back to offices. I think commercial landlords will be, uh, will continue to flourish. Uh, I think there will be a lot more flexibility, uh, which means that commercial landlords will, will have a bigger portion of their portfolio and flexible space, whether it's with us, whether it's our competitors or on their own, by the way. Uh, I think, you know, I think people will want shorter term leases and we'll figure out how to do that, uh, um, you know, uh, for them. But I think there'll be a much more reversion to the mean, but with flexibility. People want flexibility. They want, they, they're afraid uh, to sign, you know, very long term leases if it's less than 100,000 square feet. If it's greater than 100,000 square feet, it requires a lot of customization, it requires a lot of capex. The tenants all know if you want to go down that route, it's a 10 year lease. Uh, so they have to weigh flexibility to the kind of environment they have. But I do think there's a reversion to the mean. Uh, I do think space gets, um, you know, absorbed. And the good news is during this uh, upturn over the last 10 years, there's really not been an oversupply situation of commercial space. Um, so, so I do think it reverts to the mean. Sandeep, as always, it's a pleasure. I appreciate you taking the time and uh, I wish you uh, great uh, success on your, uh, on your way forward. I have no doubt that you will steer the company in a, in a, in a wonderful direction. Thanks, John. Really appreciate you taking the time and I will talk to you soon. I, I agree. You take good care. Talk to you soon.